All right, good morning and thank you everyone for logging in for today's ABS eTalk series on organic electronics connecting nature. Our presenter today is Magnus Berggren. I'm going to go through some opening slides and then we'll let we'll introduce Magnus and if he'd like to go ahead and turn on his video, uh, we'll go ahead and walk through the intro slides together. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone and uh, thank you again. Please note you are muted uh, upon logging in today. Uh, be sure your volume is up and that your screen is in full view. This is a one hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. Uh, when you registered, you were able to submit a question to be answered by Magnus. These questions were reviewed and he will do his best to answer as many as possible at the end of the e-talk. Also, uh, please move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom screen to find the Q&A option. There you are able to type additional questions to the presenter during the talk. Um, only the presenter will see these questions, review and answer them in the last 10 to 15 minutes. So please feel free to type those in as we go along. And we'll go ahead to the next slide, Magnus. All right. Uh, we also have some general disclaimers and copyright notices uh, for your review. These are general information that the presentation is based on sources belie believed to be reliable, but the AVS and the author and instructor disclaim any warranty or liability based on or relating to the contents of this e-talk. AVS and its author instructors do not endorse any products, processes, manufacturers, or suppliers. Nothing in this e-talk should be interpreted as, interpreted as implying such an endorsement. And one copyright notice, the material contained in this e-talk was copied with the permission of the author instructor of the notes who obtained copyright releases from other materials and sources. Since AVS does not own the copyright of the material in this e-talk, permission to use any part of this material must be obtained from the author instructor. And we'll go to the next slide. We do have some upcoming online events. If you're interested in pursuing any additional AVS events, please check out the AVS short course schedule page. We do have some webinars coming up on surface characterization of biomaterials with x-rays and ion guns in September. We also have some online short course training coming up in November with controlling contamination, plasma etching and RIE, and plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. They are all one day courses. Registration will be available soon. Thank you. Next slide. And we also have some Career Center webinars coming up in September, uh, Career Planning in a Crisis, How to Move Your Career Forward on September 15th, and a webinar on Modern Resumes and CVs by Lisa Balbus on September 29th. Both of these are free webinars lasting one hour time frame. And one more slide, I think. All right, and then we also have some technical meetings coming up. If you haven't seen a message from AVS, of which you most likely have if you've received the one for this e-talk, we are having a AVS 67 virtual showcase, which will be free to registrants. This is a three-day event taking place in October. Please check out the website noted on the image and you will see more details for that. Also, um, Magnus is a presenter for ICMCTF. And this event will be taking place next April. So you will see him there if you plan to participate. Our abstracts are due by October 1st. If you have any material that you'd like to submit uh, to present for that meeting, please do so by October 1st. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we are ready to introduce Magnus Berggren. He is um, he is ready to present organic electronics and connecting nature. And Magnus, I'd like to turn this over to you and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Heather. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank Heather, Yvonne and the team at AVS for setting up these e-talks um, and supporting science everywhere around the world to keep up the standards during these tough times. And I also would like to take the opportunity to thank you all for, for teaming up here today. So I will present a talk with the title Organic Electronics Connecting Nature. My name is Magnus Berggren and I'm coming from Linköping University and I'm the director of the Laboratory of Organic Electronics. Um, what we do in our lab is that we are taking conjugated polymer systems like the molecules, polymer molecules, uh, poly polymer structures shown up to the right 
which in this case is PDOT and then PSS. We blend them together, make conducting systems, and we are primarily interested in utilizing those as inks in order to make devices in a radically new fashion. And inks is interesting from many point of views, but originally this started as an idea to make electronics printable. So we basically take these inks and instead of pouring cyan or magenta, yellow and black into printing machines, we, we pour semiconductors, conductors and insulators and uh, manufacture electronics uh, and in fact quite advanced organic electronic systems these days. For instance, we can manufacture labels like this, including sensor heads up to the right, displays, push buttons, batteries, and also including several silicon chips to make, let's say, complete paper-based diagnostic systems. And we work very closely with RISE Institute here in Sweden and many collaborators around the world. Um, the laboratory organic electronics is composed of 13 PIs. Uh, we have 12 separate groups, each of them, uh, headed by, by a PI. And from the titles of these groups, you can see we do surface physics, energy materials, bioelectronics, some optics, and all kinds of different soft electronic uh, devices, and quite a lot of electrochemistry on these polymers and organic molecules. We are a large laboratory today. We are about 130 people and working very closely with RISE, and also sitting in the same, at the same premises here uh, at our laboratory. Um, and to give you a chaotic picture of uh, what we're working, we do quite a lot of photonics. We make typical standard electronic device structures. We put a lot of our devices in electrolyte and physiological conditions. We develop printing techniques. We even put electronics into plants, uh, theory and modeling, flexible electronics, and also combining cells, cells with organic nanocrystals a lot of spectroscopy done in, in, uh, in vacuum systems and quite a lot of electrochemistry. Um, I have divided my talks into uh, two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will basically go through and I will do an overview of our three, let's say, thematic areas being printed and paper electronics, organic energy technology, and then organic bioelectronics. And I will end uh, with roughly 25 minutes digging into two recent uh, reports from our lab. One is uh, termed e-gelling and the other one is ground state electron transfer in dopant free polymer conductors. So <clears throat> uh, in common for many of the devices that we're working with, we are working with conjugated uh, polymers. This is PDOT, it's an ethylene dioxy uh, polymerized system and it has a very low conductivity. However, if you dope it uh, with a uh, counter ion, for instance, being PSS, uh, you can increase the doping level. So the, in this case, the PSS system contains sulfonate ions, and those can, to a different extent, uh, dope the system. The uh, fundamental electronic structure of the um, um, Sorry, the um, <clears throat> pi conjugated system, it's composed of sp2 hybridized bonds occupying three of the four valence electrons of carbons. One of each carbon remains forming these bell-shaped orbitals and they start to overlap. So you end up with having a delocalized pi orbital system running along the, the polymer system here and that provide conductivity. In this case for holes, this is a p-type conductor. So once again, doping, we can change the, uh, the uh, um, compensated and accumulated holes in PDOT by having doping ions. And in this case, quite a number of the sulfonate ions are compensated with holes in, the, in PDOT. We can add electrolytes, we can add counter electrodes, and by addressing the electrolyte, we can establish charge neutrality based on the potential we apply up here. And then we can compensate the ionic groups of PSS that will need that, that needs to be compensated by depleting the holes in PDO. And from this point of view, we may Magnus, you have frozen. Uh, we cannot hear you.
please take a moment and see if you can um, reconnect. Yes, it is. All right, sorry about this. Um, we can also move on and use the change of energetics to make display cells that we also can print. And we can also, by utilizing the fact that we can modulate the number of charge carriers, we can make printed transistors. And if we put um, charge compounds in the electrolyte, we can generate a potential difference along the electrolyte. And from this, we can derive what we call organic ion pumps, uh, organic electronic ion pumps that we will use for drug delivery and so on. Um, the operation of this, um, um, let's say, pseudo capacitor has been a debate for, let's say, uh, at least 20 years. And uh, we have tried to gather some of the information out there and also our own results in order to distinguish between capacity processes and Faradic processes. And this was published, uh, I think, uh, a little bit more than a year ago. So let's move into printed and paper electronics. Um, this is uh, composed, uh, this thematic areas includes four different groups and the members are shown here. The prime purpose uh, is to make electronics on paper, packages, labels, and uh, one of the recent focuses has been very much on band-aids. Um, we typically utilize a combination of pick and place machines for silicon chips and screen printing to manufacture period PSS and many other of the uh, functional materials that we use. Um, and um, as you can see up here to the left, we are doing uh, screen printing of active layers just like that. And we can then, in this case, manufacture, I think, seven segment displays. As you can see, I will leave here soon. Yeah, so here they come out. Um, and we can also make from the transistors, we can uh, manufacture and design quite advanced circuits, uh, some, something between 100 and 1000 transistors on plastic foils and papers. Uh, and we can define shift registers, decoders, and many of the classical uh, circuit technology uh, in order to make digital uh, addressing and so on. One of the challenges for printer electronics, assuming we make a band-aid or, or electronics on, to go onto package, for instance, is that we certainly need the silicon chip, but we also want to add many peripheral devices like displays and also sensor heads. That would drive an enormous amount of contact pads on the silicon chip, making the price of silicon chip very expensive. You can see the rise of the silicon chip versus the number of pads. And in many cases, we would like to have something like 100 contact pads to connect all the devices, the printer devices around the silicon chip. So one of the prime targets for us is to make multiplexes and demultiplexes based on organic electrochemical transistors. And we take favor of many of the desired uh, properties of these devices being that they can run at low volt, voltages, very good stability with, with terms of operation and threshold and so on. And here you can see test uh, uh, circuits for OECT, so these printed transistors, including around 1,000 transistors on a plastic foil. We also print sensors. Uh, we're targeting sensors for metabolized neurotransmitters, physical and chemical parameters like temperature, humidity, and UV, and also for other chemical compounds. And we typically print them using the same uh, standard uh, screen printing techniques that we that I just showed for the transistors. Um, this is an illustration of how we print a shift register to address uh, uh, seven segment displays showing number one, this should actually be number two and so on. And you can see that they are all flexible. And once again, we are merging these devices into labels, including displays, uh, uh, routing transistors and sensors and so on. And we are also shipping out this technology into, let's say, initiatives uh, in order to make um, uh, commercial products based on this technology. Let's move on to the organic en energy technology. Um, this is uh, based on the fact that we have a lot of, let's say, hydrocarbons uh, in nature and also available uh, synthetically. And we are primarily focusing on using components from the forest. Uh, Sweden and the Nordic countries has a lot of forest industry and we have been supported by this industry for many years in order to use the prime components 
from trees being lignin and cellulose, combine it with organic um, conductors trying to make energy technology. These are the five teams working with this and um, uh, we are working quite a lot on the synthetic approach trying to develop new materials. We do a lot of electrochemistry, electrochemical devices and also thermoelectricity, uh, th thermoelectric generators based on this. So one of the prime targets is to combine organic materials or carbon-based materials with carbon and cellulose and lignin. Um, this is the conductor, this is the structural carrier, and this is the redox polymer. Um, and together they are forming the two electrodes of a battery. And the idea is that can maybe best be illustrated what we are aiming for here. So we're taking PEDOT, being a synthetic conductor, combine it with cellulose. Uh, this forms an ink that are then finally coated on substrates that are initially being patterned to form aluminum electrodes. We print carbon on, on top, activated carbon, and then we print our ink or coat our ink on top to make electrodes forming the anode and cathode the, or the positrode and negatrode of pseudocapacitors and batteries. Uh, we can print all kinds of forms. In this case, it's a four by four um, uh, uh, sheet technology that we can patch and uh, define up to 16 volt in this if each cell generates one volt. Um, our prime target are not really related to any um, mobile applications uh, or anything like that, but uh, it's uh, really targeting grid applications as will be shown uh, in the last illustration here. So of course there is a po possibility to use this, let's say for a green tech battery technology, but our prime focus is basically going for giant scale um, technologies to compensate for availability for green electricity and demands in our society and use those as to basically to perform peak shaving. Um, we have done quite a lot of work to understand how PSS organize, for instance, on cellulose. And this is TM images. You can see crystallites forming. Uh, we have about one nanometer size crystallites on carbon or, or cell cellulose fibers. And the conclusion is that we have PSS with nanocrystallites of PEDOT on uh, nanocellulose fibers. And they form electrodes with a giant surface area, uh, even reaching up to several hundred square meters per gram, which is a fantastic uh, um, asset when you want to make supercapacitors and batteries. We're also including lignosulfonate being a redox polymers. They have typically include alcohol groups that can be oxidized to form carbonyl group. And in the uh, capacitance or in the CV diagram, we can discern the capacitive contribution from PEDOT. And the more lignosulfonate or lignin that we add, the more oxidation chemistry, so oxidation and reduction chemistry we include. And this is the discharge curve from PEDOT alone. And you can see that we maintain a voltage for a longer time at a constant discharge current, the more lignin we add. So basically converting this supercapacitor to become a battery technology. We also use the same electrode, PEDOT PSS, uh, at the negative potentials, it has enough conductivity and we are in this case interested in convert electrochemically via oxygen reduction reaction, oxygen into hydrogen peroxide for future fuel applications. So that's another sidetrack. We also do quite a lot of ionic thermoelectrics where we have polyelectrolytes combined with PEDO PSS to have selective uh, migration of either anions or cations uh, to, de to derive chargeable capacitors that are driven entirely by uh, thermal gradients. We have a few initi initiatives on the battery, on membranes, and also on um, uh, thermoelectric generators uh, based on these findings. The last area, thematic area of our lab is organic bioelectronics. I will briefly go through what we're doing there. So one target is to use the printed sensors that we are developing and then um, uh, include uh, sensors 
as they record a parameter on our body or in our body passing a certain threshold, it can communicate directly with drug delivery devices. And the idea is to have a diagnostic tool that you carry along with you, uh, along with the drug delivery devices that can communicate to the cloud to get instructions for regulating drug dispensing and so on. And of course, we are aware of the ethical and uh, safety issues with such a technology and work very closely with uh, all kinds of um, uh, software uh, groups around the world in order to solve these challenges. Uh, in the bioelectronics, we are very interested in the conversion of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sensory um, uh, input that re uh, is received in our body that is converted into uh, let's say electrical uh, transportation uh, due to depolarization in our body in our nerves that is finally recorded both in our in our spine uh, but also in the brain as pain sensation or, or any other sensation uh, and we are trying to understand how we can use organic electronics to impact the signaling and also to to um, for instance regulate and down regulate pain uh, sensation the bioelectronics team uh, are guided uh, by four PIs having their own separate groups and all together they are around 60 people in the lab. Uh, once again, using payload PSS, uh, trying to understand how we can do uh, translation or transduction between biological signals and electrons and vice versa to basically convert an electronic addressing signal into the delivery of biological molecules as well. So this is the kind of communication loop that we are very interested in to see how we can utilize so basically sensory functionality and then drug delivery functionality. Um, we are working with all kinds of devices, devices that even are implanted into animal models, flexible electrodes for neuronal uh, recordings, and also all kinds of electrochemical devices. Um, so one of our core technology that we have been working with, with uh, for more than uh, 15 years is the organic uh, ion pump. Uh, it's a device that converts an electrical signal into the delivery of, uh, in this case, neurotransmitters at the end. And I will show an illustration how this works. So starting with an electrical signal, it reaches the pedal PSS electrode having a huge capacitance and it can be polarized, generating a potential gradient in a channel, uh, then forcing uh, molecules to pass. So this channel co is composed of selective electrolytes where only one particular charge and the molecule with the correct size can pass through. And we are very much focused on neurotransmitters in order to regulate all kinds of functionalities uh, within the nervous system. Um, we have used this in many applications, as I said, and it started really with controlling pain. So we inserted a, an ion pump into the spine of uh, rat and guinea pig models. And um, by having four outlets coinciding with the third to sixth dorsal horn of the spinal cord, we uh, targeted to deliver a neurotransmitter at these sites because this is where the pain sensation is generated in this particular rat model. and it, uh, it's also the positions in our body where, where actually the pain sensation is generated. This is basically an ionic circuit in order to control. So we polarize PDOT, generating a potential gradient along these uh, resistive features. Then we can deliver, in this case, the neurotransmitter GABA into the spine. And by doing that, we could see that the withdrawal threshold or the pain threshold in this animal model could be considerably changed uh, uh, in comparison with control experiments where we, for instance, pump protons or any, any other non-potent molecules. But it's only for GABA that we really can change the pain threshold. And of course, we are not targeting patients with ordinary pain symptoms that can be easily treated with painkillers. This is primarily target uh, patients that are suffering with pathological pain uh, that are normally chronic to its nature. We are now hunting down uh, the synapse. We are trying to beat the synaptic speed. The synapse typically convert the signal within a millisecond. And we are working with, uh, let's say, ionic rectifiers where we shrink down the dimensions, where we can deliver ions 
within a millisecond uh, range. And we are basically reaching a millisecond time scale before turning on uh, until we have actual delivery of neurotransmitters. We're taking this technology and insert it into fibers uh, that can deliver and also record signals. And the idea is to put those into the brain tissue or into the uh, 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 other parts of the central nervous system like the spine, but also to the peripheral nervous system to record and actuate uh, various kinds of um, uh, neuronal signaling in order to, compat to combat uh, uh, pathological pain, but also neurological disorders in general. We also apply this to plants uh, in order to regulate um, uh, various kinds of physiologicals. So we are very interested to see how the, let's say, signaling works in plants. And one of the critical and still unanswered questions in plant biology is how does the stoma gateways on, on the uh, backside of leaves actually work? It's known that there includes all kinds of uh, signaling molecules. And these are the gateways that regulate the uptake of carbon dioxide and the release of oxygen and water. So it's basically the, the gas regulator or vapor regulator of, of plants. So it's known that you have um, guard cells that open and close. And we are interested in uh, dispensing uh, um, neuronal or um, I'd say signaling molecules of the plant kingdom to see if, which one is the most potent one to open and close it, this artificially. This is the ion pump. And here you can see different kind. You can see these are the cells on the backside of the leaf. And here you have one uh, stomata gateway and you have a few other ones around here. So um, inserting this ion pump, dispensing, and by diffusion, these molecules move uh, and we would then expect to have a square root dependence of the closing and opening and the distance. Uh, these are how the experiments look like, we open and close, uh, waiting 20, 30, 60 minutes, and then we look at different distance away from the outlet. Uh, to our great surprise, we found that there's a linear correlation between the distance and the time lag before open and close strongly suggesting that there are actually signaling pathways that are amplified between these cells. Something we don't understand at all right now, but it's an interesting uh, discovery that this is perfect linear correlation. We have a few initiatives also on this um, to be launched and tested uh, among labs uh, around the world. And we are trying to achieve a system, as I said, where we have sensor patches distributed on the body to recording all kinds of uh, important parameters to monitor the health status or, or disorders. We are um, basically um, uh, storing all this information in a carrying unit, and then we can launch, launch this hopefully to device to combat um, seizures or any other uh, disorders uh, due to uh, neurological uh, diseases and so on. And one of the prime targets is, of course, epilepsy, where the medical doctor scientists know perfectly well what kind of uh, neurotransmitters that can suppress neurological disorders. However, the time lag, the first, first indications like um, uh, tremors and, uh, and sweating to the actual launch of the trigger of the um, uh, epileptic uh, seizure is within a few seconds, so there is typically no time to go for medication. So this is a typical case where you need to basically carry the system. In order to find out if we can have sensors on our body, recording electronics, sending it to an ion pump, everything dumped into a cell phone or any other portable device, and then sent out to the cloud, back, and then deciding to launch uh, uh, and for instance, a neurotransmitter. In this case, we are showing that we can basically have sensors. In this, just, in this case, just monitoring. And now we start the pump and you can see immediately it actually launched uh, the dispensing. And everything is communicated 
through a decision protocol that is stored in the cloud. So we can definitely run sensors, deliver devices, all connected even to the cloud with decision making within, let's say, a few seconds. So there seems to be hope for a, for a fast diagnostic monitoring and drug delivery technique based on this. Then I will move on to the second part of my talk where I go through some of the recent uh, reports. Uh, one is called e-gelling and the other one is ground state electron transfer. E-gelling started a few years ago with a discovery in our lab where we saw that we had claddings along fibers and when we applied a potential we could see this amorphous or nanocrystalline cladding layer completely convert into a gelled structure. <clears throat> and this was a great surprise to us and then we wanted to find out what really happened in this and see if we can actually explore this. Gelling is of course and swelling of, the, of giant scales is very important for instance in in our body when we have wound healing. <clears throat> it's also cells in, in nature all, all around that swells and, and then contract in order to control, control movements for instance in plants. We have engineering applications like beads and we have drug delivery. So basically gels is a very important part um, in our society and also in nature. Um, gelling is um, something that has been studied heavily from a chemical and a theoretical point of view in the past. And I would say that Flory with his thermodynamic approach, statistical approach on polymers was perhaps one of the first one, did fantastic work understanding solubility and so on. Um, and you can promote solubility in polymers by having dipoles uh, on the side chain and dipoles in the solution and you will, by increasing the entropy, dissolve this system very easily. Hydrogels are components that rely on solubility, but you have a cross-linking in between the soluble chains, so they can only partly go into solution. So you have cross-links either residing directly on the main chain of the polymers or via side chains that basically hold them together. And that will restrict solubility and make the polymer enter into a state called gel. So it contains much more solution molecules still maintaining a semi-solid state uh, thanks to these crosslinks. Uh, and in the past, there has been quite a lot of work uh, on stimuli responsive hydrogels where for instance, light, temperature, pH or chemical agents has controlled the number of crosslinks, making a gel system that can contract, contract heavily and also expand. And there has been reports in the, uh, in, in the past of volume changes reaching from factor of, let's say, double 100% up to even 10,000%. Uh, and illustrate this here, for instance, light, you bleach out a crosslink and then the polymer chains can separate. There is another area uh, called polymer electroactuators where electronic signals modulate the, um, the volume of the polymer and it's not based on controlling the cross-linking sites or the number of cross-links. It's actually including the fact that you have conducting polymers and you need to compensate those as they are operating in uh, aqueous media or electrolyt electrolytic media. And the fact that you include an ion includes also a solvation shell and the volume this occupies and the number of ions you include basically represent the uh, controlling volume. This is uh, very efficient, but it's also restricted to very small changes in volume, typically 10 to 30%. There are few reports reaching 100%. So our goal was to uh, investigate if we have the capability of reaching, let's say, 10,000% with all electronic control um, uh, of swelling. And we came across the material, it's a thiethylene glycol substituted polythiophene. So this guy makes the material soluble, and then you have a thiophene backbone that form pi pi stacking. So once again, this is the material. So you have pi pi stacking between the conjugated systems, so polymers tend to stack on top of each other, and once again, the side groups drives solubility. So you have two competing. So this one drives entropy and this drives enthalpy, you can say in, in, in thermodynamic wording. So the idea here is to see if we could actually have a system 
where we can control the volume. Uh, so at zero charge, there are no charges included here. They seem to pack PyPy stacking and all these side groups are sticking out. And then we have taken 250 of those. This is molecular dynamics modeling into a box, including water, these materials, and we can see they form a polycrystalline or semi-amorphous system with water all around. Then we increase the charge. We start to get pi, uh, the pi pi stacking is disturbed to some extent due to uh, columbic repulsion. We still maintain solubility driving force of the side group because they are non-conducting. And the more charge we add, the more repulsion we have. And let's say up to the maximum degree of charging, in this case, four for 20 rings, we still maintain at least some um, uh, van der Waals interaction between the chains. So it doesn't go full into solution. Um, and then it has become more or less like a gel system. So this is purely a molecular dynamics calculation. Let's see what happens in reality. So we take fibers, carbon, uh, carbon nanofibers. We coat it with um, this material, the PT2T. And then we apply a signal, in this case 0.5 volt, and you can see this, this cladding layer enter into a semi-swollen state. We can do this uh, increase in volume. Uh, it's large in the beginning, and then it seems to stay around factor two to three. Um, and it's completely reversible. We can run these days up to many hundreds of cycles back and forth. Um, However, if we apply 0.8 volt, reaching to a maximized level of oxidation, you can see that this cladding layer entered completely into a gel state. And this indicates that we have a giant volume switching. It's a small volume switching uh, when we operate at plus 0.5 volt. However, only going to 0.8, we have this giant swelling. In this case, it swells 120 times. And it's unfortunately completely irreversible. We can only make this switch only once. We have also monitored this uh, using coarse crystal microbalance uh, to see how much volume uh, increase, basically how much weight is gained within this film. So this is an oscillating technology, oscillatory technology to basically calculate the mass added. So in the frequency shift, we can see that we have a massive change in all the overtones in the ground tone and also the, all the overtones, which is indicative to a massive change in volume. Not only that, also the elasticity change a lot. And this is a very large number for changing elastic, elasticity in, in uh, using QCMD. So we can see that basically it goes from a very stiff material into a very jelly or, or um, uh, a system with, high, uh, with a very low um, uh, Young's module. Basically, that's what it says. I'd like to show you a video of how we make this very simple claddings on the fiber. We take a carbon fiber, uh, we rotate it inside a um, container, including a solution. We process it from organic solvents. We rotate this at the same time that we remove this in order to make a, at least some kind of homogeneous uh, cladding on these fibers. So we have the carbon fiber being conducting. And then when we apply a voltage, you can see that entirely by electric addressing, it enters into a gel state. And of course, uh, we need to operate those in electrolytic media. So we have uh, ions and a counter electrode somewhere in this electrolyte. All right, so what to use this for? We have um, a new technology, a new interesting material that swells tremendously upon applying an electric signal. We took those and added these materials as claddings along sponges and all kinds of fibers uh, that are conducting. And by uh, doing that, we still have a porous system. However, when we apply voltage, you can see that the walls of this um, um, sponge uh, uh, electrode uh, grows because of the swelling of the material. And we, you can see that we start to shrink the pore size. We have recently discovered that we can actually completely close the openings of both filters and of sponges. Perhaps we can use this for drug delivery and also to control the pore size for sieves and, and technologies like that in the future. Then I will end my talk with, uh, by presenting a um, 
technology um, that has been ongoing for a few years where we have discovered that you can have a complete ground state electron transfer from one conjugated polymer being the donor and then another conducting uh, polymer or conjugated polymer can receive it then becoming the, the acceptor. Um, we have two prime polymer systems being the PG42TT. This is a P-type molecule having holes conducting along the backbone. We have BBL being an N-type system. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, the electron affinity of this material is far down and we have a, uh, of BBL, the N-type material, and we have the P-type material with a very low uh, ionization, uh, ionization potential. And if they are close enough, they could potentially be a spontaneous electron transfer from the p-type material to the n-type material. Um, and why are we interested in this? Uh, we have p dot pss and in this system only p dot is electrically conducting. So this is, let's say, the uh, uh, electron acceptor. This is the electron donor. And it's only the electron donor that is uh, conducting in this case. What if we actually could have both this system electric, electrically conducting? We have systems where we have aromatic uh, dopants, but they are not conducting and they are also very uh, volatile. They don't, don't stay uh, for a long time and also change its conductivity uh, in part due to that this can migrate and even escape the film. So the idea here is to have, uh, uh, in this case, the polythiophene derivative and BBL compensating each other. And as you apply an electric field, we should have a system where the electrons can be conducting in the acceptor and the holes can be uh, conducting then in the donor polymer. So that is the idea. In order to make a systematic review of different classical P-type materials having different ionization potential versus this fixed uh, electron affinity of BBL, uh, by in uh, low energy inverse photoelectron spectroscopy, spectroscopy we uh, uh, nailed the, the LUMO level and HOMO level of BBL, and we are then interested in the ionization potential of the P-type materials. BBL, N-type, and all these polythiophenes are P-type. And the simplest one in, in my mind is the poly 3 hexothiophene. It's this guy. Uh, it has quite a large difference between the uh, ionization potential and the electron affinity of BBL. So we shouldn't expect too much of spontaneous electron transfer. However, for the PG42TT material, they are almost overlapping. There should be enough of uh, orbitals overlapping from the ionization potential of this polythiophene with the BBL. So we should expect at least some kind of electron transfer, spontaneous electron transfer here. So by taking these materials uh, and putting it on top of BBL, so this is the N-type one, and then the different P-types goes on top. Uh, by just measuring the conductivity along the film of BBL alone, and then on the polythiophenes, uh, these are the, let's say the, the IV curves of these measurements going from minus, minus one to one volt, as soon as we put them on top of each other, we see a tremendous increase of the current over orders of magnitude. Uh, we both, uh, in this case, showing two different kind of p-type materials on top of BBL. And we can see for both cases, we see a tremendous increase in current. Um, by also looking at the resistive values and monitor the uh, resistive values over uh, inverse temperatures, we can see that for the uh, separate ones, we have high activation energy, and for the sandwich ones, we see that the activation energy for transport goes down, indicating that we have uh, much, uh, we have a completely different uh, nature of transport and that we also have a much higher uh, charge density in the system. Um, yeah, and here are the values for all the uh, reviewed systems going from P3HT and to the one with the lowest resistivity, which becomes the PG42TT BBL system. We've also looked at the uh, uh, thermoelectric properties by 
uh, monitoring the CBEC coefficient for these ones. This is the CBEC coefficient for um, the single polymers alone. As soon as we sandwich them, the CBEC coefficients go down and it jumps down much more for the for this guy, which is the one that we have the smallest difference between electron affinity and ionization potential, which is good news, indicating that the nature of uh, charge carriers are, are both positive and negative. Um, and um, also by doing kinetic Monte Carlo modeling, taking the resistive values, the uh, activation energy, we can uh, then calculate the or, or simulate the number of charge carriers versus the vacuum shift that we can establish by putting these materials uh, close together. And this, the larger the vacuum shift becomes, and it's the largest for this, of course, this system where the ionization potential and affinity are closest. And we can see then that the number of charge carriers increases. And we should then expect that this one also has the largest amount of charge carriers along this interface. A way to directly uh, probe the charge carriers in, in uh, materials is to use electron paramagnetic res uh, resonance. And uh, this is a way to monitor unpaired electrons displaying a spin. Uh, and in these systems, we should expect that we have at least some high degree of unpaired electrons, but there is also risk if the charge density becomes too high they actually form pairs and uh, turn into bipolarants, and then we cannot monitor using this. But nevertheless, we see that we have basically no signal in the um, uh, materials alone. Then we take P3HT on top of BBL, we see a small signature, but when we take PG42TT on top of BBL, we see a giant signal indicating uh, that we have uh, polar ones with quite high density. However, we don't know if it's P-type or N-type, um, but there are spectroscopy techniques where each of the whole polar on or the um, elect uh, negatively charged polar on uh, become discerned in the absorption spectra. By looking at the differential absorption of the materials alone, and when we sand sandwich them, we see features popping up and by doing P-type doping with oxygen in this material, and then N-type doping, we can get spectroscopic signatures. This is the signature or signature in PG40T uh, for P-polarons, and this is for N-polarons. And in fact, when we do this double layer, we start to see signatures for both electrons and, but also for polarons, which is a good sign that this is something that you should have if you have a spontaneous transfer of electrons from one material to the other. You should see both the holes and the electrons. And this is good news. We see both of them in this spectroscopic nature. Uh, we can also do DFT calculation, uh, time dependent, uh, in order to look at the oscillator strains uh, uh, upon excitations. And we can also see that the polar on levels for the electron and also for the holes coincide very well with, with, with the data that we actually record in the absorption spectra. So let's focus on the successful one, which is the BBL PG4 2TT material. And then we vary the concentration in bulk heterojunction. We are going away from just a bilayer to just blend the system together. And they spontaneously form phase separations on the order of a length scale of a few nanometers up to tens of nanometers. We have blends going from basically zero all the way up to 100%, and we see the maximum uh, CBEC coefficient for very small amounts of BBL, suggesting that the electron conductivity is the dominant uh, conductivity in this, uh, and the CBEC coefficient then flattens out. And the uh, conductivity seems to peak at around 50-50. Um, and then we look at stability or conductivity over extended period times. And uh, we see if we dope with TDAE, chemically doping, or if we dope other systems to get basically P and, and N dope. And if we compare, compare them with a the blend, we can see that stability is much greater. And we reach a conductivity of around uh, 0.2 Siemens per centimeter in these systems. 
We can also make uh, electrode sta um, diode stacks, top electrode, bottom electrode. We see that we have perfect ohmic contacts. And then if we make a um, unsymmetric diode with a low work function electrode and a high work function electrode, and by including BBL, we can see that we turn it from a diode to more a symmetric device, indicating that BBL blended with PG42T really changed the Fermi level on this bottom electrode to become much smaller. I2 is a classical hole injector, and now it turns into become an electron injecting layer. We can also include those in as the bottom electrode in OLEDs, showing that we can make electron injection to form light emitting diodes, and we can also print those onto papers. So this is the first time uh, of a report where we have a spontaneous electron transfer from an electron donor to an electron acceptor where both of the systems are conjugated polymers. And we recently published this, uh, including a huge collection of fantastic teams all around the world helping out uh, with this story. And particularly I would like to thank Kai Chu and Simone Fabiano for running this uh, project for, for a few years time. So by this, I would like to thank you very much for, for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions. Magnus, thank you very much for your time. If you'd like to bring your video back on while we do Q&A, I do see there is one question. And uh, if we'd like to give more time, I can read through the closing slides first. See you. Before you close out. Uh, for those of you who do have questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A box while Magnus is still online. We would like to answer those questions for you. I want to thank everybody for participating and thank you for your patience during some technical issues and login details. And I hope you enjoyed the e-talk. Magnus, I want to thank you very much for your time in preparation and presentation of this e-talk and for doing our test runs with us. Can you bring up those closing slides, please? Let's see. Let's... All right. So I do want to remind people that uh, we do have AVS membership. Uh, this membership does give you access to publications, professional career development, technical resources, including our journals. We have uh, five different journals that may be of interest to a variety of you. Um, discounts on registration for symposia, short courses, webinars, et cetera. Uh, membership is a nominal fee. So if you are interested in more, learning more about AVS in general and other online events, please check out our website at www.avs.org. And I think there's one more slide. Um, so yeah, following this e-talk, again, just check out the website. We have AVS membership benefits, including the discounts and uh, webinars. Um, if you're a student, this is also a great time to find out about student membership, student chapter, career services, et cetera, and find ways to get involved. Angela Klink is our member services coordinator. Uh, you can also reach her if you have membership questions. I do see there are a couple of uh, questions or comments. Magnus, if you'd like to address those for everyone. Let's see. Um, so questions. They should be at the <coughs> Should I share that? Um, you can read the questions and then... Okay. So from Vines, uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Can you say a few additional words about glucose sensing? The current sensors are not sufficient. I have used most of them. I can provide additional details offline if desired. Uh, absolutely. Uh, glucose, sensing is, uh, glucose sensing is, uh, I would say, the most explored biosensor ever and, and of course glucose sensor sensing is um, a challenging thing particularly in vivo because stability issues. Uh, we have tried to stay away from some of the uh, glucose sensing because it's a, it's a very crowded area and to be honest we are not performing better than any of the ones that are out there. Um, however glucose sensing is or Glucose electrodes are interesting. We use them to some extent to actually drive some of our electronics. That's where we are primarily using this today. So I cannot give you any uh, um, 
tremendous uh, discoveries on glucose sensing, claiming that they are super stable or so. But I'm looking to forward to, to more discussion on this. Um, so moving on to a question from Jenny Malmström. Um, how did you get your e-gelling films thin enough to do QCMD? Uh, that's a good question. So um, we spin coat from chloroform or other organic solvents and we have basically used the classic dilution pro protocol to go down in, in concentration. I would guess we are around one milligram per milliliter concentration and just applying a, a high speed to spin coat those onto the QCM electrodes. That's basically what we have done. That's answer enough. Um, and then from Katerina Artyoshkova, do you find surface analytical techniques such as XPS, UPS, LAPES useful in determining electronic properties of materials? Absolutely. In fact, one of the groups um, headed by Mats Farman, professor in uh, surface physics and chemistry in, in our lab, uh, has a collection of uh, Scienta and other XPS, UPS tools. And uh, absolutely, it's super critical for, for our science to do good estimation of the energetics, uh, Fermi levels, um, band gaps, uh, and all that. Absolutely. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to type those in. We'll give you one more minute to proceed. If not, uh, we'll let everybody log off. But Magnus, again, I'd like to thank you for your time and effort putting this presentation together. And I hope everybody who participated enjoyed this talk and received some valuable information. Just a reminder that he will be presenting at ICMCTF 2021 next year. So please check out information on the AVS website events calendar and or go to the ICMCTF uh, conference website if you are already receiving those details. Um, I would take and I would like to take the opportunity to to thank you all for teaming up um, today uh, and I would like to thank AVS Heather and the team the dream team at AVS for organizing this and, and uh, helping out with good uh, conferences and meetings uh, in the digital world during the corona, uh, corona time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Magnus. I am not seeing any additional questions. So again, thank you everyone. And we will go ahead and log out. Thank you again, Magnus. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.